Hello everybody and welcome back to yet another Doctor Who target novelisation review. In today's review, the third instalment of the series, I'm going to be taking a look at yet another adventure featuring the 15th Doctor and Ruby Sunday, this time Rogue, as written by Kit Harron and Bryony Redman. Now, excitingly, this book is actually written by the people who also wrote the TV story, which is a first for this series so far. Available in multiple different formats, including good old traditional book, I do love the design of these books. It's also available digitally on Kindle, as well as an audiobook read by Dan Starkey. As always, I love the presentation of these books. They are such a nice size, making them very easy to slot into a bag, and you know, they're just very travelable. Everything about them is really satisfying. Book target novelization continues to use the darker colour palette, the darker blues and blacks, this lovely scattered night sky design. The 60th anniversary logo is present in the centre, looking very smart. Of course, the Who stands out a lot thanks to that lovely golden embossing, and you've got to love that traditional Target logo in the top corner. The central title and the author's names are a simple but effective font. The spine does continue this lovely light blue design. It stands out from the other Targets released within the new series. Again, the spine text stands out a lot with multiple different colours. Flipping around to the back, this continues the simplistic but effective Target novelisation design. We almost have a selling point at the top of the book this time round rather than a regular regular quote. It's an isolated image of the 15th Doctor there, taken directly from the cover. Also have a very brief story synopsis, as well as the traditional target novelisation credits. All of your boring stuff, your barcodes, your company details are isolated to the bottom. Much like the other summer 2024 target releases, we have another brand new artwork by Daniel Lyles, and this, I have to say, is probably my least favourite of the wave, but it still sports some lovely details. It's a rather bizarre cover. Like Giant House, of course, the location of the story is scattered throughout the entirety of the background. Have India Varama there as the Duchess. In fact, probably one of my favourite illustrations from this cover. It's a shame she's not slightly bigger. I would have loved to see the colours and all the feathers and plumage in a little bit more detail. I feel like she's hiding away in the background. Same with this guy with his comical eyebrows and moustache. It's a shame that we can't see more of him. He's definitely hiding away. Another creepy bird woman there. Again, slightly lost in the rest of the image. Of course, Rogue and Fifteen are framed running along the outer gardens of the giant house. You have a hedge there in the background, a lovely vibrant green, a rather powdery looking floor. Our two central characters, of course, Fifteen and Rogue, these are really nice likenesses. Shooty in particular stands out a lot. He's looking very shocked. I love the presentation of his very glamorous outfit. Detailing is absolutely spot on. I love the various shades used, different white trousers there underneath and the cream shirt. It all looks incredibly stunning. I mean, it's a really lovely representation of Rogue's outfit as well, that darker blue, the light blue shirt, the slightly darker trousers, they're running along holding hands, isn't that nice? You think the baby's head is at a slightly weird angle? I don't quite know, there's something about it and I can't quite decide what. Don't get me wrong, Daniel Lyles is incredibly talented and the detail on this image is superb, I just think the placement of the imagery overall is not my favourite. It's different, it stands out, I imagine some people will love it, but I think having the long shots of both of the characters in full costume maybe is a mistake in my eyes, I think having some slightly closer up imagery would have been better, would have been nice to have Ruby on there as well, but let's face it, she's on all of the other covers, so it's nice to have a bit of an exception. This target novelisation is slightly longer than the others, coming in at 215 pages across 33 chapters. Although the typography itself is a really nice size, it's another very easy read. You can get through this one quite quickly. And this one is, of course, my favourite chapter, for obvious reasons. Well, ball gowns at the ready. I am, in fact, wearing mine especially for this review, although, sadly, due to it being audio, you can't see it, which, you know, is a shame for everyone, I'm sure. So, Rogue as a target novelisation absolutely does not play about when it comes to introducing new content. The story begins with Rogue himself on a completely different bounty hunter mission, tracking down the leader of an interplanetary commercial drink company known as Gurgle. And within this mission, he is accompanied by his partner, who goes by the name of Art. And instantly, as a reader, we are treated to a much more vivid glimpse into Rogue's life, which reduces that sense of distance I personally had with the character during the televised story. Although I have to admit, it did throw me off a little bit, because I was expecting to go into a period drama, and all of a sudden we were in the distant future. So reading the first chapter or two of this book multiple times is definitely something that I recommend, just to ease yourself into the story. It's a bold way to start, it works well, it just took a bit of getting used to. 
As we know, of course, within the story, the loss of art haunts Rogue throughout the Regency period and no doubt the rest of his life, and the character parallels that he sees within the Doctor and art together create a really satisfying context, which makes the way that they click within the story feel a little bit more real. I'm starting to see already why they are somewhat attracted to each other. I will be honest, Rogue was one of my least favourite stories of the season, sadly. I still enjoyed it, I just didn't completely relate to the plot. I think it was a little bit out of my tastes when it comes to a Doctor Who story. As much as I love a historical, this one erred towards more the Bridgerton-style romance, which isn't really my thing, which is completely fine. Doctor Who's all about variety, and this one wasn't really in my ballpark. So as a result, it was never going to be the first Target book that I read from the 2024 publications, but I'm glad that I did make time to get around to this one, as I now respect the narrative a lot more. That blend between science fiction and history really works. I love Ruby's excitement in picking this location and experiencing the luxury of this period. Weirdly, she does in fact want and is excited by exactly the same thing as the monster of the story, the shoulder. There's just a lot less death involved with Ruby's tastes and she doesn't want to kill everyone, which, you know, is good. It's a good thing. You expect that from a normal, everyday human. I do also like how we explore Ruby's interactions with the characters a little bit more deeply within this story. It feels like that she's getting to know people a bit more. And I love how she compares those around her at this party with the people that she knows within 2024. In fact, one of my favourite quotes from the book is when Ruby discovers the pair having their little romantic tiff within the library, and it reads... And it was there that Ruby regretted following them. She thought that she had been chasing danger. Now it felt more like that time that she got trapped in a toilet cubicle in Weatherspoons as a couple broke up outside it, which is a event in life that I'm sure quite a lot of us relate to. I did love a good Spoons night out within my uni years, I can't lie. I just love from this scene how we can infer that Ruby has nights out at Spoons, no doubt with her friends in the band that we got introduced to within the church on Ruby Road, and of course there is also mentions to house parties within this story, Dua Lipa, music playlists, people fighting over music playlists, and Ruby's habit to binge watch TV. And all of this makes Ruby feel like a living and breathing younger adult that has came from 2024. She does 2024 things, and I'm just glad that there wasn't any mention to TikTok, because I probably would have put the book down at that point. Imagine Ruby getting to an alien world, and then seeing these vast alien vistas, and it being incredibly impressive, and she places down her iPhone and start doing a weird dance routine to Charlie XCX. No thank you. I'm sure the 15th Doctor would drop her straight off back home. All that said, he'd probably actually get involved. I could certainly imagine Shooty doing a number of TikTok dance routines. So moving on to the darkness and bloodthirsty elements of this story, as I think it does that quite well. The way the various deaths are described feel very grim. It mentions twisting and stretching flesh. The victims are described as carcasses, which this makes the shoulder feel much more of a worthy opponent to the Doctor. They're incredibly animalistic and brutal, whilst also hitting home that they really do just kill for fun. They don't really consider humans as important at all. The Duchess, in particular, is very deadly. She describes herself as the arbiter of taste, so she clearly has an ego. And funnily enough, that ego is also present within the actual Duchess prior to her death. She's worried that she's dying in the wrong colour of dress, which I love that little reference. I thought it was very nice. It made me smile. But it goes to show how these people, the children, the people at this party, are just incredibly self-centred and obsessed with themselves. They want to look good, and they don't really care about anyone else in the room unless it's drama. The new content throughout this Target novelization I thought was very measured. A lot of the significant new additions are slotted throughout the book in small chapters rather than integrated into the story itself. So we have the previously mentioned rogue prologue, some contextual backstory to the shoulder as well, and their various previous invasions of other worlds. This again builds that sense of threat. Whilst working as exposition, it is then incorporated into the regular scenes that we've seen on screen. Overall, all, this provides an element of depth which I think the televised adventure lacks, which again, it made me appreciate the episode more. As I mentioned within my previous reviews of the 2024 Target novelizations, I think time constraints and leaving a lot for the viewer to infer within the most recent series, I think is one of its biggest flaws. And something each and every Target so far has done a very good attempt of ironing out and making the stories flow better, feel a bit more consistent, and add extra levels to them. We've got a much bigger onion to unpeel this time round. 
And when I hear more context, the exploration of Rogue's emotions, his loss, glimpses into his average day-to-day life prior to this adventure, making tools of art and sharing memories with art, that spirit of adventure and excitement the Doctor brings into his life, and he kind of reminds him what life is all about. This gave me more confidence in believing the relationship that they had on screen, and I could suspend my belief a little bit more and actually believe this relationship that was flourishing in front of me, because I felt like in the episode it was a little bit forced, and other than having some chemistry, I couldn't particularly read that much into it, I didn't connect much to that dynamic. But in the book, I did appreciate it a lot more. Interestingly, of course, Ruby attaches herself to Emily within this episode, and I completely forgot about her when going into this book, and they navigate the party goers together, explore the Regency relationships and all of the drama which comes with it, and all of this does make it feel much more romantic, it's a period dramatic society, everything is very heightened, just like how you would get in Bridgerton, and we have references to the likes of Mr. Darcy too. I think there is a very clever choice of words which allows the older readers to perhaps read in between the lines of this book, and perhaps understand a few things that would go over the younger audience's head, such as why it's quite useful to have carefully potted plants around the house to somewhat subdue and muffle the sounds from the garden, which is helpful for certain characters, particularly if they're together and they want to cause a little bit of scandal. Or why certain characters, I quote, spend the entire evening side by side, only parting when the sun rose. Hmm, I see you. Maybe again this adds a further element of realism to the romantic tension within this story, especially between Rogue and Fifteen, because everything just feels a little bit more padded out. But again, back onto Emily, of course, Ruby's friend within the story. As I mentioned, I actually forgot that she was a Cholder within the episode. I think that Kit Heron and Bryony Redman take a lot of time to make this character feel real, feel innocent. She's a bookworm who preps for social occasions and social interaction. So when it's revealed that she is a Cholder and wants to go after Ruby, the person that she's befriended throughout the whole story, of course, we've seen their relationship blossom across multiple chapters. It actually feels like a proper brutal a trail of trust. But within the story on TV, I think you could definitely see that revelation coming a mile off. Within the book, it absolutely caught me off guard. It goes without saying, though, if you've watched the TV story, you no doubt know exactly what to expect from this book, but that is completely okay, as it meets the goal of what a target novelization sets out to do. And as I mentioned within my previous reviews of the likes of 73 Yards and the Space Babies, I think at times it can be difficult to set aside your personal critiques of the series as a whole, and certainly for me, hope that the target can somehow rectify some of the issues that I had within the series by adding in new content, filling in the gaps. And arguably, yes, I would have liked a few additional scenes, perhaps more 15 dedicated content, exploring this particular incarnation of the Doctor a little bit more, how he feels, his outlook on life. And as much as I do love Shooty's portrayal, I think it is brilliant, I would still feel like I don't properly know this incarnation of the Doctor yet, despite us having had a whole series with the character, and given the whole story's reliance on that relationship with Rogue, and maybe I was seeing this story out of the lot within this series as having the best opportunity to explore that identity further. So overall, for Rogue as a target novelization, it was enjoyable, it was fun, it's another reliant retelling of the TV episode, but it doesn't stray too far at all from the TV script, but instead adds a flourish, depth and further nods to the underlying complexity of the characters that we get within this story, certainly a lot more than we had on screen. It's an easy, accessible read, it uses lots of nice language, but I think there is an element to it where the older audience will perhaps get a little bit more from this book than the younger audience, which is interesting. But if you like the TV episode, or particularly if you felt invested by Rogue as a character, I think you will especially enjoy this read, as the majority of the new material and references is to pad him out. If anything, he gets the most attention, so does the shoulder, and if anything, Fifteen and Ruby are the ones that don't get as much development, which I think, given that we have other adventures with them, Rogue was the character that I wanted to discover more about going into this book, and that's exactly what I got. 
So there we go, that is my target novelisation review of Rogue, as written by Kit Heron and Bryony Redman, of course the actual writers of the TV episode, so it was nice to see them add in elements that they were no doubt considering for the TV story, but probably couldn't do for budget constraints. So I do appreciate this book, and I think I definitely found more respect for this episode having read the book. So that's good. It's a positive. If you do like target novelizations, do check out my other reviews. I've already covered 73 Yards and Space Babies. No doubt a review of The Church on Ruby Road, the fourth and final publication from the summer 2024 releases will be on the way soon. But up until then, have a nice day. I shall see you all next time.